Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob arrived in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah last night for a one-day working visit. The Premier arrived on a special flight at about 11.37pm at Terminal 2 of the Kota Kinabalu International Airport or KKIA. His arrival was welcomed by Chief Minister Datuk Sri Haji Jin Noor and Deputy Chief Minister Datuk Sri Bong Mukta Radin, as well as several other state leaders. Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri launched the National Youth Day or HBN 2022 at Padang Pekan Tuaran. Various activities have been planned for the three days of HBN 2022, including netball, badminton, silat, career exhibitions, as well as concert gagar HBN. At least 10,000 visitors are projected to attend the event. HBN 2022 is organised and managed jointly with the Youth and Sports Ministry, KBS, and KBS Sabah, representing the state government. The event also involves collaboration with main strategic partners, namely the Malaysian Youth Council and Sabah Youth Council. Now, the government is planning to focus more on greater involvement of youths in urban farming. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob announced that the Youth and Sports Ministry, or KBS, Agriculture and Food Industry Ministry, or MAFI, as well as the Federal Department of Land and Mines, or JKPTG, have formed a strategic partnership to achieve the target. Terbaru, Kerajaan melalui kerjasama strategik KBS, Kementerian Belia dan Sukan, Kementerian Pertanian dan Industri Makanan, MAFI, dan Jabatan Ketua Pengarah Tanah dan Galian Persekutuan memberi tumpuan lebih kepada pertanian bandar. Ini merupakan strategi bagi meningkatkan penglibatan golongan belia dalam sektor agro makanan selain program agro perniaga muda. Sejumlah 8,000 usahawan muda telah menerima bantuan meliputi geran, pembiayaan serta kursus jangka masa pendek, hidmat nasihat teknikal dan kewangan. The Premier explained that agro-food can provide lucrative returns if managed well and utilising the latest technology. On a related note, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said the unemployment rate among youths nationwide showed a decrease to 5.3% for the first quarter of this year compared to 5.9% in the same period last year. Now, this brings the number of unemployed in the first quarter of this year to 585,000 people compared to 620,000 last year. The Malaysian Agriculture Research and Development Institute, or MARDI, has developed a new variety of specialty rice called MARDI Rice Aroma, or Maria. The variant is said to mature faster and yield more compared to earlier varieties. Agriculture and Food Industries Minister Datuk Sri Dr. Ronald Candy said the hybrid variety, also known as MRQ-103, is a cross between the MRQ-89 and MRQ-50 and took 13 years to develop at a cost of nearly 1 million ringgit. Mari akan terus membuat kajian dan kajian-kajian uh, bukan saja pada padi tetapi pada tanaman-tanaman uh, lain untuk uh, menentukan bahawa kita mempunyai benih padi, benih bobohan, uh, teknologi uh, yang mampu menentukan, memastikan kelangsungan, uh, bekalan makanan dan sekuriti makanan negara. He said Maria, which grows to a height of 105 centimeters, can be harvested in 117 to 120 days and yields over 5 metric tons per hectare. Now, this variety also has medium resistance to rice blast disease and the brown plant hopper and is moderately vulnerable to bacterial and web blight as well as tongue root disease. To date, Mardi has created 53 varieties of paddy. Now, bankruptcy cases trend among individuals has been declining since 2016, including the period during which the overnight policy rate, or OPR, was raised in 2018. According to Bank Negara Malaysia or BNM Governor Tan Sri Nur Samsia Muhammad Yunus, this was based on the latest trend and information provided by banks and selected non-bank institutions. 
The number of individuals aged below 35 who are bankrupt also showed a similar decreasing trend, constituting 14% of bankruptcy cases from January to May 2022. She said this in reply to the bankruptcy issue, which has often been exaggerated as being synonymous with the financial situation, which has gotten worse, and claimed by the Malaysian Association of Borrowers and Consumers, which recently associated the hike in OPR with the bankruptcy trend. In 2018, a total of 5,283 bankruptcy cases were recorded. 3,948 cases were registered in 2019 and 2,844 cases in 2020. And 2021 saw 1,884 cases. A bankruptcy action is the last resort taken by the financial institutions after all recovery efforts have been exhausted to get back the loans given to borrowers. The government has disbursed 20.89 billion ringgit to 357,895 employers through the Wage Subsidy Program or PSU up to 1st of July 2022. The financial aid was implemented to help keep 2.96 million local workers employed in an effort to reduce unemployment. According to Finance Minister Tengku Datuk Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz, for PSU 1, a total of 322,177 employers and 2.64 million workers benefited from the Prihatin Rakyat Economic Stimulus Package and the National Recovery Plan, Panjana. Now, this comprised wage subsidy applications worth 12.96 billion ringgit approved as of 1st of July. And the PSU 2, up to the same date, a total of 1.41 billion ringgit had been dispersed to 81,158 employers, helping to maintain the employment of 719,024 workers. For PSU 3.0, 3.77 billion ringgit had been given to 162,307 employers, helping to sustain 1.53 million jobs. The Finance Minister said PSU 3.0 has been improved with the Permai, Pumakasa and Permakasa Plus economic aid packages. Under Pamule, the government implemented PSU 4.0 with an allocation of 3.8 billion ringgit expected to benefit 2.5 million workers. The Pharma Niaga Berha, which was entrusted by the Health Ministry to distribute supplies of Paxlovid, has already sent the COVID-19 antiviral drug to hospitals and clinics nationwide. The matter was announced by Pharma Niaga Managing Director Datuk Zulkanai Mama Yusop. Memberi tugas ada tanggungjawab kepada Pharma Niaga untuk membuat pembekalan kepada hospital-hospital milik kerajaan dan juga klinik-klinik milik kerajaan yang mana Bila apabila diarahkan kita perlu hantar kita akan hantar. Jadi stok tu bukan stok farma niaga. Stok tu milik kerajaan. Regarding the stocks for the Sinovac vaccine ahead of possible COVID-19 waves, Datuk Zurkanain said there is ample supply in the reserves which are ready to be dispensed. The stocked vaccines are also good until at least the end of next year before they expire. He said this after the signing of Memorandum of Understanding with China's Suzhou Ronzi Pharma Company Limited or Ronzi. A total of 19 deaths in police custody have been reported since January this year. According to Royal Malaysia Police or PDRM Secretary Mdato Norsia Muhammad Saadudin, of the total, nine were deaths in lockups, eight cases involved deaths at the hospital, and two died while being taken to the hospital. The death cases will be investigated by the Criminal Investigation Unit on Deaths in Custody, USJKT, under the Bukit Aman Integrity and Standard Compliance Department, GIPS, that was established earlier this year. Now, 14 of those who died were Malays, while one death each were recorded for Chinese and Indian. Meanwhile, three cases involved foreigners, which consist of those from Myanmar, two cases, and Indonesia, one case.
Datuk Nur Siasa yesterday, a meeting was held with the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia or Suhakam and the Enforcement Agency Integrity Commission, EAIC, to discuss the progress of the investigation into the death in custody cases. The collaboration with other agencies was part of PDRM's efforts to address the issue of deaths in police custody. Front White House to withdraw peacekeeping force in Red Sea Island. Stay with us. Mexican military have captured notorious drug lord Rafael Caro Quintero, convicted for the murder and torture of a U.S. anti-narcotics agent in 1985, a major coup for both Mexican and U.S. law enforcement agencies. Now, the kingpin rose to prominence as a co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel, one of Latin America's most powerful drug trafficking organizations during the 1980s and had been among the most prized targets for U.S. officials. Caro Quintero spent 28 years in prison for the brutal murder of former U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, agent Enrique Kiki Camarena, one of the most notorious murders in Mexico's bloody narco wars that led to a nadir in U.S.-Mexico cooperation in the five-decade-long war on drugs. Caro Quintero has previously denied involvement in the killing of Camarena. In 2013, Caro Quintero was released on a technicality by a Mexican judge where he quickly went underground and returned to trafficking. He was placed on the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitive list and had a $20 million bounty on his head, a record for a drug trafficker. While Caro Quintero is no longer considered a major player in the international drug trafficking world, the symbolic impact of his capture is likely to be significant on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, Mexico's unwillingness to extradite Caro Quintero to the United States prior to his release from prison had always been a source of tension between the two countries, and Washington is likely to demand his extradition once again. Now, last year, Caro Quintero lost a final appeal against extradition to the United States. A decades-old multinational peacekeeping force is set to leave a strategic Red Sea island located near Egypt, Israel and Saudi Arabia by the end of the year. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden announced the matter during his visit to Saudi Arabia, while a separate White House fact sheet specified the timeline. Analysts say the move could spur further contacts between Israel and Saudi Arabia as they chart a possible path towards formal bilateral ties. The islands of Tehran and neighboring Sanafir, both barren and uninhabited, have been a source of conflict in the past, thanks to their key location at the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba, on which Jordan's only seaport and Israel's Elat Harbor are located. Now, Egypt ceded the islands located east of its resort town of Sham el Sheikh in 2016 to Saudi Arabia, which wants to develop them for tourism. But the deal requires Israel's green light at a time when the Jewish state and Saudi Arabia have no formal ties. A senior Israeli official said late Thursday that Israel would have no objection to greenlighting Egypt's handing over the islands to Saudi Arabia as a step towards normalization of ties between Riyadh and the Jewish state. The issue is said to be on the agenda when Biden meets Arab leaders, including Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, at a summit in Jeddah later today. Over in the UK, the five remaining Conservative candidates to become Britain's next Prime Minister clashed on Friday night over tax and honesty in politics in their first TV debate as they fight to make an eventual two-person runoff. The 90-minute debate, the first chance in the day's old contest for both the frontrunners and lesser-known contenders to pitch their credentials to a national television audience. 
The debate saw relatively few direct confrontations between them. But when they did erupt, it came largely over taxation, with former finance minister Rishi Sunak, one of the frontrunners, forced to defend plans to keep rates at some of the highest levels in decades. Now, Sunak, who has topped the first two rounds of voting by Tory MPs this week, as the race narrows towards a final pair next week, is up against several contenders vowing to cut various taxes immediately. Meanwhile, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss pitched her tax slashing plans in the face of a spiralling cost of living crisis, in contrast against Sunak's pitch. The trust battling to unite the ruling party's right wing behind her so far lagging campaign after twice finishing third in votes has positioned herself as a low tax free marketeer. Now, she has backing from prominent Johnson's loyalists, despite wanting to reverse his government's recent tax rise earmarked for health care. The United Nations Security Council on Friday unanimously threatened targeted sanctions against criminal gangs and human rights abusers in Haiti and called on countries to stop a flow of guns to the strife-torn Caribbean country. Now, violence has soared since the assassination last year of President Jovenel Moise, which created a political vacuum that gangs have taken advantage of to expand control over territory. Well, China voted in favour of the resolution on Friday, which extended a UN political mission in Haiti for 12 months. It expressed disappointment that the 15-member body had not imposed a formal arms embargo on gangs in Haiti. Now, China took an unusually active stance in the Security Council negotiations on the resolution, drafted by the United States and Mexico. To the eye of China, Haiti has long recognised Taiwan's sovereignty. Now, some analysts once say again, Beijing may know. see the impending political transition in Haiti as a chance to convince the country to swap its diplomatic ties to China from Taiwan. The UN political mission in Haiti works with the government to strengthen political stability and good governance, rights protections and justice reform and to help with the holding of free and fair elections. Large trucks and banner-waving demonstrators blocked the Pan American Highway and other roads in Panama on Friday as two weeks of revolt against high prices and corruption showed no signs of abating. Now, as protesters ignored government calls for negotiations to end the angry mobilization, dozens of blockades were maintained on the critical highway that connects the country of 4.4 million people to the rest of Central America. With its economy hurt by the coronavirus pandemic and Russia's war on Ukraine, Panama is experiencing one of its most difficult periods since the military dictatorship of General Manuel Antonio Noriega fell in 1989. Year-on-year inflation of 4.2% was recorded in May, along with an unemployment rate of about 10% and fuel price hikes of nearly 50% since January. Now, despite its dollarized economy and high growth figures, the country has a high rate of social inequality. Economic woes have led to a shortage of fuel in some parts of the country, and stalls at food markets in the capital have run out of products to sell. In a bid to calm the mood, President Laurentino Cortizo has announced reductions on the price of fuel and some foods, but unions rejected the measure as insufficient and refused to take part in negotiations scheduled for Thursday with mediation by the Catholic Church. Ricky Martin, the singer, has been accused of incest by his 21-year-old nephew and could face up to 50 years in prison if convicted, reports indicate. Now, the singer was hit with a restraining order stemming from a domestic violence incident in Puerto Rico earlier this month. However, the victim's identity had been withheld. His brother, Eric Martin, has since identified the alleged victim as the singer's nephew, Dennis Yadiel Sanchez. 
Martin is accused of exercising physical and psychological attacks on Sanchez during their seven-month relationship, which ended about two months ago. A representative for the married father of four, 50 years old, previously called the abuse allegations completely false and fabricated in a statement provided to People earlier this month. Now, the star who was spotted in Los Angeles Friday on the set of his new Apple TV Plus miniseries is expected in Puerto Rican court on the 21st of July for his trial. Sport, Malaysia under-19 squad beat Laos to grab second AFF title. The Selangor State Government has decided to redevelop the 30-year-old Shah Alam Stadium and sports facilities in the surrounding areas. Now, the new stadium will be inspired by IX Amsterdam Stadium, which can accommodate between 60 to 70,000 spectators at any one time. Menteri Besar Datuk Sri Amiruddin Shari said the decision to redevelop was made after a thorough consideration. The state government has appointed Malaysian Resources Corporation Berhado, MRCB, to carry out the redevelopment of Shah Alam Stadium and sports facilities in the surrounding areas at a cost of about 787 million ringgit. Kalau melihat kepada saya terhadap faktor sejarah dan sebagainya, kita minat untuk mengekalkan. Tetapi saya tidak mahu menutup langsung peluang itu kerana akhirnya kos untuk refurbishment saja 700 juta. Stadium ini dibina dengan nilai 400 juta. Maknanya gandaan hampir sekali ganda untuk refurbish saja stadium ini. So saya tidak mahu nolak untuk kita membangunkan semula stadium ini dengan kapasiti yang sesuai, dengan kemudahan yang sesuai. Datuk Sri Amiruddin was met after witnessing the handover of the Letter of Intent or LOI by Selangor State Secretary Datuk Haris Kasim to MRCB Executive Vice President Datuk Del Akbar Khan Haider Khan yesterday at the Sultan Salahuddin Abdul Aziz Shah building. The project is expected to begin early next year and completed in 2026 in line with the construction of the Light Rail Transit or LRT3 nearby. Shalom Stadium suffered damage including to the changing rooms, electrical supply and spectator seats when it was hit by floods on three occasions, 2006, 2015 and last year. Now, Malaysia has won its second under-19 ASEAN Football Federation Championship or AFF in four years after beating Laos 2-0 in the finals in Bekasi, Indonesia yesterday. Their victory at Patriot Chandrabaga Stadium also avenges their defeat in the last Group B match at the hands of Laos last Monday. Malaysia began well in the final, taking the lead through Mama Faiz Amiruniza in the 14th minute. And Laos were stung into action using aggressive gameplay and continuously threatening Malaysia with a series of attempts but failed to find the net. Malaysia steadily absorbed the pressure and their discipline was repaid when they went 2-0 ahead in the 76th minute with midfielder Mohamed Alif Izwan Yuslan scoring off a lob shot from teammate Mohamed Alif Farhan Fauzi. Now Malaysia once again displayed fine discipline by defending their lead till the final whistle and brought their championship campaign to a spectacular close. The under-19 national squad has the best record in the last three editions of this championship, having won the 2018 edition as well as coming in second in 2017 and 2019. 
Manchester United have signed Christian Eriksen on a free transfer with the Danish playmaker signing a three-year deal. Now, Eriksen, who suffered a near-fatal cardiac arrest in a European Championship match against Finland in June last year, returned to action with Brentford after signing a short-term deal in January. Eriksen is United's second recruit in the close season under new Dutch manager Eric Ten Hag after the club signed Dutch left-back Terrell Malassia. Eriksen was an Inter Milan player when he collapsed and underwent surgery to be fitted with an implantable cardioverter defib or ICD device which is not permitted in the Italian Serie A leading to the termination of his contract. Now, after signing for Brentford, he made 11 league appearances under Danish coach Thomas Frank, scoring a goal and providing four assists as Brentford finished 13th in their first season in the Premier League. He's no stranger to the Premier League, however, having spent nearly seven seasons with Tottenham Hotspur, making more than 300 appearances in all competitions for the London side. He also resumed his Denmark career, scoring against Serbia on his return to the Parken Stadium, where he had collapsed. Still on football, former Leeds United star Rapinha said that he was fulfilling a childhood dream by playing for Barcelona and following in the footsteps of fellow Brazilians such as Romario, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho and Neymar. Rapinha was unveiled at the club's Camp Nou Stadium yesterday after signing a contract until June 2027 with a buyout clause of a billion euros. Comecei a acompanhar o Barcelona, na verdade, depois da vinda do Ronaldo para cá. É... Obviamente que a, que a participação dele, tudo que ele fez aqui, influenciou bastante, que foi onde eu comecei a acompanhar o clube, foi onde eu comecei a torcer pelo Barcelona. É... E depois, mesmo dele ter ido embora, continuei sendo um torcedor do Barcelona, continuei com o meu desejo de, de um dia poder realizar meu sonho de vir para cá, de, de ser um... Um, a metade do que ele foi aqui para o Barcelona, para mim, já é muita coisa. Leeds United agreed terms to sell the flamboyant 25-year-old to Barca for a reported 58 million euros transfer fee. The price of the transfer could ultimately be boosted to 68 million with add-ons. Rapinha made his full senior debut for Brazil in October and has since earned nine caps and scored three goals for the national side. He is the second major player to depart Leeds this summer following Calvin Phillips' move to Manchester City. Why do we tell you stories? Relevant. New. Efficient. Accurate. Reliable. We bring you extraordinary stories from around the world, from politicians, bankers, and even your favorite celebrities. This and many more on RTM's English News. And that's a wrap of today's updates at noon. Reminder of our headlines. Differences in chicken prices are well influenced by various, various factors. Don't forget to tune into News at 10, coming up at 10 p.m. on Salora Brita RTM for more updates. I'm Jessica Lee. Thank you for watching.